I want to talk about is the challenge that we face as a society, the, why we're having these meetings in Durban, and, and to some extent why they've got to, got to do a great deal a lot faster. And what we really need to do is both, and I'll come to this later in the presentation, talking about slowing the pace of climate change and limiting peak climate change. Um, now, reducing CO2 emissions is essential. That's what's causing the problem, um, primarily. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but uh, it hasn't been very successful yet because it's difficult to do. It's maybe costly to do and difficult to do, and sometimes difficult to convince people to do before you get to really large impacts. Um, the CO2 emissions are really what you want to focus on to limit the peak climate change because they're so long lasting and they go from they stay there. It turns out there's a very interesting new report and it's something I've been writing about and working on for several uh, years which has to do with short-lived species. So the importance of getting at methane, uh, black carbon, tropospheric ozone, and I'll show you some things that show how important those are to get at and why. And if you get at those because they're short-lived, you can do something in the near term. Um, but even if we do all of these things, the question is, can we get to two degrees? Uh, and that, as I said, is probably too high a value. Now, I put in this diagram, which I hope you're all really familiar with, right? <laughs> Everybody <laughs> understands this diagram. But I'm going to say some things about it that perhaps you haven't heard. Uh, and and it's, it, you'll be interested to know, OK, so I, I have a tape from a 1982 talk I gave on climate change. And I was saying this back then. So this all right. so. So we have the, the baseline going up, the base value going up, and that's going up to fossil fuels. But you have this seasonal variation going on. Um, and so the CO2 is high in the spring, and then as everything grows, it gets pulled down, and, and then it comes back up. If Mauna Loa is a rep representative of the northern hemisphere, and we think it is, this change is seven to eight parts per million. If you multiply by the volume of the northern hemisphere, you can find out how much carbon is sort of going in and out of the northern hemisphere into the greening of the biosphere and then coming out each year. So that sort of net change. There's more going on, but that's sort of the net change. And we sort of know that's not happening in the southern hemisphere, so it's a northern hemisphere phenomenon. And it turns out, very roughly, one part per million in the northern hemisphere variation is one billion tons of carbon. Now, I'm a scientist, I'm going to talk in billions of tons of carbon. In the negotiations, they multiply by 3.67 because they count the mass of the two oxygen molecules. Scientists want to keep track of atoms, not oxygens attached to them. And so we talk about billions of tons of carbon. So, so seven, per eight, seven or eight parts per million is seven or eight billion tons of carbon per year. Okay? That's roughly what the emissions are from CO2 right now, seven or eight billion tons a year. Now, it doesn't go up that much each year because half of it gets mixed to the southern hemisphere and then half of it's getting taken up by the land biosphere and the oceans. And so it's going up by a quarter of what the emissions are in billions of tons. So when we say this 2.4 parts per million per year going up in 2010, which we're not to, if you multiply by four, you get to roughly the billions of tons of carbon coming out from fossil fuels. So it's about eight or nine billion tons of carbon that are coming in. That's a lot of carbon um, and everything. And so people who say, well, um, as was done in the 1990s uh, in some places, oh, I'm going to plant more trees along the expressways or something like that, you know, in the open land, and that's going to take care of the problem, have no sense of what the scale of this problem is. It's the equivalent of the net greening of the biosphere that you see in Jack Kay's movies, that, you know, NASA's movies of, of what happens to the Earth over time. When we do that. Big number. And I'll come back to that. But remember, it's sort of how big a billion tons of, of carbon is. And so for every, um, basically for every four billion tons of carbon you put out, the part per million goes up by one. So we'll, we'll do some, we're going to do some math coming up on some of that, some simple math. All right, so this is another figure that sort of comes from the IPCC report about the projection in time, except I've changed it a little bit. Uh, the original IPCC figure references the temperature increases from 1990, and 
that's sort of cheaty because what the international leaders have said in this two degrees is from pre-industrial times. And so we really want to know the whole time. We want to count the past and the present. So, so that gray part on the left is the observed uh, increase in temperature that we've had so far, about eight-tenths of a degree here. And these are the projections for low, middle, and high scenario emissions over the, um, over the 21st century out to 2100. And all of them, even the optimal green strategy, which is the purpley one, um, get us over two degrees C. So even if the world basically completely cooperates, new technologies come along, um, renewable technologies and everything, we're, we're headed toward over two degrees. It's going to be really hard to stay, stay under that. And this two degrees is what people have said is dangerous, and as I say, a number of us say less than that is dangerous. Um, so, so, so what are the things we can do? All right, so I'm going to, you know, th this sort of goes up to, to 2100. I'm going to sort of look to the future, because if you look at these high scenarios, um, they're still headed up in the year 2100. So I'm going to go out a little bit future, and I'm going to take sort of a, a relatively carbon intensive scenario, not the most carbon intensive scenarios, but we're on sort of that path. And, and that's, this is sort of where it would take us in terms of temperature. I don't do plots as well as professionals, but. So this is temperature increase from pre industrial. This little purple thing is where we are. And this is sort of where we're headed out for the next couple of hundred years. Um, up to six or seven degrees would be easy to do if you keep on a cold scenario or, you, or we go to a well shield. Keystone pipeline shape or something like that. Um, so we're really headed up, and we've got to figure out how to deal with this. And so what are the things you can do to deal with this? Um, oh, I wanted to just give you a reference just to say, what you know, just a few degrees matter. Six degrees is basically the difference between the peak of the last interglacial, I mean the last glacial and today. So if you go back 20,000 years when there was a mile thick ice on the northern half of North America and a bunch of stuff in Europe, we were six degrees colder than at present. Sea level was down 120 meters. Okay, so when people talk about temperature change and how much sea level rise you can change, that's huge. All right, so so six degrees is a big number as far as from planetary history. Um, this is just another way to get to this two degrees. I'm going to sort of put a safe zone on there, but but say this is a diagram pretty much from post IPCC. Um, that, uh, that, that was sort of uh, done. Um, IPCC didn't approve, I guess, a redo of the embers diagram and, and coming down some. But if you look at some of the things that are happening, there are already things happening now, like we're losing a lot of small mountain glaciers. Um, you know, there's going to be rising yields and some are falling. In others, we're starting ice sheet melting at well less than two degrees. Um, and so there's a lot of concerns when you get out here. So two degrees you're already going to have some impact. That's sort of, I mean, fossil fuels provide 80% of the world's energy, so they're providing tremendous benefits. They're keeping the world alive. You couldn't keep the world alive without fossil fuel energy. So there are some trade-offs here, but pretty pretty soon, as you push up here, you get to these, you get into some pretty serious trade-offs. All right, so let's say uh, this, this line goes across one and a half degrees because you want to maybe stay under two degrees, but whatever. We're somewhere down here. So if we accept that this is where we're going to be going and we're willing to suffer the consequences of this, um, then this is what you have to deal with. Um, and so here's a, a graph from uh, Ken Caldera that's sort of a way of looking at what our choices are. So if you look at what causes the problem, everything's sort of connected. You start with the desire for well-being. That creates a demand for products. That creates a demand for energy. That leads to emissions. That leads to higher concentrations in the atmosphere. Leads to impacts on the climate and then on ecosystems. And then people are sort of having to live through that. So where can you intervene? Well, first thing is conservation, if you can reduce and, and you can get copies of all. I'll give you a copy of all this slide. <coughs> um, you know, conservation, you can say, well, I will just do with less. Okay. Um, and so I'll create less demand for goods and services. Um, I can improve the efficiency so the goods and services I get, I can get more efficiently. 
Um, I can change to other kinds of ways of getting fuel. I don't have to create CO2 with it, so I have sort of mitigation and alternative technologies. Um, now, one of the next approaches, which is one of the ones called geoengineering, included in, in that, but we've been using other terms, is say, okay, well, I'm going to put out CO2, but I'm not going to let it increase the atmosphere concentration, so I'm going to pull that out. One of the I mean, carbon capture and storage is over here, so if it's still in the power plant coming out the stack and I capture it, that's called mitigation in this strange, wonderful logic. If, if it gets out of the stack and then I have to pull it out of the atmosphere somehow, that's called carbon dioxide removal or geoengineering of some kind. Okay. So if you reduce deforestation, which you might do here, that's uh, a mitigation kind of thing. If you build, put forests in new areas to put carbon out and irrigate deserts to do that, um, then uh, that's called carbon dioxide removal. There's actually, for, for scale on some of them, there's actually a very interesting proposal that somebody did think, well, what if we could, wanted to pull all the carbon out by growing new species? And the calculation they did, and I think it was, you sort of reforest the Sahara and you reforest Australia totally. Okay. Australia did it with eucalyptus, and you do solar power and stuff to pump irrigation water around. Of course, what happens when the trees get big is they burn and so then you're in trouble. But people have done calculations. It's a huge change to try and do it this way. Um, then you can say, well, I want to reduce the impacts. And so, um, I can say, well, these, this causes a trapping of energy, so I'm going to reduce that by offsetting it by reducing the amount of solar radiation coming in. Put up mirrors or something. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, and we'll come back to the first Lagrange point. Okay, so, so that, to the extent you can't do that, you have uh, impacts being created. You can say, well, I'm going to adapt to them. I'm just going to adjust to those kinds of things. Some you can adjust to, some you have to move and get relocated to, you have migration or something, and some you're just going to uh, have trouble with, and then what you're left with is sort of suffering. Okay, so th these are sort of your choices, okay? And, 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 and if, you know, where are you going to go? So efficiency is clearly very cost effective if people want to go there, but you do have to have power and, and energy, and a lot of people in the world don't have any energy now, so efficiency is a little hard to be the cure for them or conservation, you know, so there are these different things, and so, so um, you know, what the focus on primarily right now is mitigation, don't, you know, reduce, go to alternative technologies, um, and adaptation, um, but we're getting so large here that we're going to be pressing on adaptation, and people are saying this is pretty expensive, and so the question is, do I do these two uh, kinds of, of things, and so it sort of fits in here, and so when when you sort of say, oh, there are ethical questions about that, this is sort of fitting in. It's worth asking the question.